guys ready? Good deal. Good deal. Can I pray for us first? Let's do this. Jesus, we love you. We are here for you. Father God, we lay aside our plans and our agendas. I thank you that you've got one thing in mind, and that's our best. I just pray that you would open up our ears, you would open up our hearts, you would open up my mouth, and I pray that every word would be graced and anointed and inspired. I pray that it would bring forth the, the harvest that you intended to. We thank you for your presence in this place. We love you so very much. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. All right. Um, let's have fun, guys. So, there's a story in Scripture. This thing, is, this thing is intense. I feel like I've got to break open the word behind this. So, occasionally, I'm going to step aside. I'm going to step aside. There's a story in Scripture that, um, that we're all familiar with. Uh, you can find it in Mark 4. Jesus has just gotten through teaching. His disciples, he's just recently called them. They're new to him. And he says, hey, guys, I'm done. Let's go across to the other side. Uh, I, wanna, I got some business to take care of. And we know the story. They set off on the boat. Uh, Jesus goes to sleep in the back. And what happens? The storm comes. The storm comes. The chaos, the turmoil, the clouds are dark. The waves, the, the scriptures say that the waves are filling the boat. They are going down. It is bad, okay? And Jesus is he's curled up. He's sleeping. And they wake him. They wake him up. They shake him. They wake him. And they say, Jesus, do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus, in just what is an epic move, wakes up. He's, he's rubbing the sleep out of his eyes. like, hey, guys, chill. Chill. Peace. Waves. You chill. And the scriptures say that the disciples are afraid. They're like, who is this guy right here? That the, that the wind, the very wind and waves would obey him. Now, look, we are people of faith. Listen, I'm talking to people of faith. If you're in here and you're not a believer... Uh, go see my mom. She can introduce you to Jesus. <laughs> but if you know Jesus, I'm talking to you tonight. Yeah. We're people of faith. We have no problem believing that Jesus, that God the Father, wants to involve himself in the natural, that he wants to, to calm the, the, the storm, right? That we, we love that story. We get hype about that. But here's my question to you tonight. What happens when the storm is inside? See, why is it that our faith begins to waver? Sometimes we don't even engage our faith when the, the location of the storm, man, the, 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 the meteorologist doesn't know anything about it. Your neighbor doesn't even know anything about it because the storm is here. So tonight, if you will let me, with my notes that I got off of Google, I'm just playing. <laughs> I want to talk to you about your emotions yeah, I just triggered some people in there with that. <laughs> I said the word emotions, and you, you immediately like flashed to that guy you got the beef with, or that person maybe that, is, that sinned against you so many years ago, or maybe that person that you sinned against. Some of you rolled your eyes, not, not here, but in your heart, because you don't want to hear that message. And listen, that just proves uh, the point that we all have emotions, and that none of us do it all the way right. Amen? So, I don't know why it is, but emotions don't get quite the same play in church that maybe outside the church they talk about it, right? And I think it is because emotions don't always seem very spiritual. They don't seem very spiritual. It seems kind of carnal. Now, look, you can turn on the television. You can turn on the, the, the radio. You hear about emotions out in the world a lot. But in, in church, we don't always talk about emotions. It doesn't really feel spiritual enough. But we make a mistake when we think that God doesn't care about those things. And I'm, I'm putting like spiritual in, in air quotes. Because God doesn't make, um, we're not Legos. God doesn't just like piece us together. For whatever reason, I don't know where this misconception came from, but we, we like to think sometimes that God cares about pieces of us and other pieces of us, he could take it or leave it. That's not, it's not the case, guys, it's not the case. There's an ancient prayer in the scriptures in Deuteronomy 6, it's called the Shema. The, the Jews pray this in the morning and in the evening, uh, and it's very simple, and you've probably heard it. Uh, it's, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul 
in all of your might now it's easy to, to to hear that and read that and think that it is telling us to love the lord our god with all of our pieces with all of our components and and, and if we think that way we start to believe that the pieces are independent that they're all together separate that there's this one and this one in this one but in reality the ancient Jews would have believed that this was a, a reminder to not love God with your pieces but with your whole with your whole because we do live in a day and age guys where like if 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 you say Chris man there's not a lot of difference between that there's a ton of difference between that because today in 2023 um, if this one piece of you doesn't agree with this other piece of you we think it's okay to just swap that out I did not come to preach that message. That's for you later, okay? <laughs> but that's where we are, right? Yeah. Oh, man, if this piece of me doesn't align with this other piece of me, I'll just get another piece. I'll just rename that piece. We're not, I'm not doing that, I promise. I'm, I'm, that, I just stepped on it. I'm leaving it. I promise. I'm gone. <laughs> Pastor, that's yours. But, but that same mentality... That same mentality of, of, of I've, I've got pieces of me that are, that are reserved for God and pieces that are not has leaked over into the church. And I call it pasta salad Christianity. Where are my pasta salad eaters at? I see you. Here's what I like about pasta salad, man. You get your bowl of pasta salad, you look at it, you know all the ingredients off top. I, I don't even have to scoop in there. I can see, I can see the little noodles, tricolor only, right? That's the only right way to do it. Some pepperoni. I like a little pepperoni in mine. The mozzarella, you know. And I like olives in mine. Anybody like olives? Yes. Who hates olives? Who hate? I see you back there. You came to the right church service. It's not okay to hate. We're going to pray. We're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with that. But listen, here's what's cool about pasta salad. Here's what's cool about pasta salad. You can eat around the olives. But that's what we do with God. We bring to God the things that we're comfortable with. Hey, God. Bless my body. God, work on my body. Lord, this is a piece of me. Lord, work on my pocketbooks. Hey, 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 God, save my spirit. But, but Lord, that bitterness, leave that alone. Eat, or, eat around that. Work around that. That's mine. That's mine. That's, that's, that's not how God made us. Listen, I, I'm here to, to it, remind or inform you, you are not just an assembly of pieces. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. He knit you in your mother's womb. And what do we call that? You, you're, you, there's a bun in the oven. And when you pull the bun out, you can't find the eggs. You can't find the milk. Show me the flour. No, 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 you're a whole. And he cares about the whole. God is not interested in, in loving a piece of you. He's not interested in changing a piece of you. He's not interested in affecting a piece of you. He wants the whole of you. He wants the whole of you. And listen to this. God's not going to ask you, just like this prayer, the Shema, God's not going to ask you to love him with any part of you that he has not loved first. It is. It is. But I want you to hear it. I'm going to say it again. God's not asking you to love him with any part of you that he's not loved first. And that includes your emotions, even the raggedy ones. Right? And we all have those. How many of you would say that you, you can deal and handle your emotions with 100% perfection if it just were not for people? <laughs> They'd be messing you up, man. They'd be messing me up. People, they'd be messing me up. I would have this stuff on lock if it just were not for folks. Listen, let's go to the scriptures. We do not have to go far in the scriptures uh, to find people mishandling emotions there was only four people on the earth and the murder uh, murder happened and and they were all family right and so that makes me feel good about my own home life right <laughs> that listen i forgot i forgot to shout out my wife that's as Kristen. we rolled deep we got about a million kids over there hopefully sh not stressing the people i don't know what y'all do with bad kids y'all put their their face on the screen is it <laughs> Are they going to text me during? I'm just not even going to look back there. Okay. Yeah, my three-year-old, y'all. Let's pray right now. Let's just pray again. No, no, no. Go to Genesis 4. We do not have to go far in the scriptures to see people act out. Genesis 4. We know this story, but I want you to listen to it with fresh ears, please, okay? Uh, this is the story of Cain and of Abel. 
and they're, they're making their, their, their sacrifice, their offering to the Lord. And I want to pick it up uh, in verse 2. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So here's the question. What brought sin to Cain's door? And listen, I grew up in the church. I, like I was born in the back pew. Thank you, mom. I've heard, I've heard Cain and Abel like on the felt board. What y'all know about the felt, the felt characters in the Sunday school and they're, they're walking around like that? I've known Cain and Abel for a long time, and I would have thought Cain, Cain was tripping because of his offering. His offering was jacked up. But that's not actually the case. His offering was wrong. But what we see is actually a father to a son say, hey, listen, that's the wrong way, but there's a right way. This is, it, this is like the most loving correction that, that God could do. Hey, listen, you got another shot. We can make this right. It's not, it's not Cain's jacked up offering that brought sin to his door. It was Cain's unchecked emotion it was emotion run amok it was his anger right it was his anger and, and listen I, I again growing up I just thought like Cain's this angry guy just walking around all mad all the time all the time no 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 the scriptures say uh, that Cain became angry and his face was downcast Cain Cain was sad Cain was hurt Cain was hurt and we don't think about Cain that way. We think about the mean old Cain hitting his brother in the head with a rock out in the field. Cain was grieved. And there's a lot of angry people today walking around with that facade. Man, they're, they're, they're big mad. But they're frustrated. And they're wounded. And they're hurt. We don't see that. Anger is a secondary emotion. But there's an initial wound. And it's easier to dress yourself sometimes in anger to protect yourself. It's a defense mechanism a lot of times. But Cain was sad, and Lord recognized it, right? So uh, it's important to remember, guys, reading this story, and, and the older that I've got, I, I think I've learned this. Um, you've got to take the, the, these Bible characters from the felt board and remember that they're real people. They're like, they're real people. They had real conversations. They have real personalities. They're not, they, they might have existed a long time ago, but they were just as human as you and I are today. So the reality is if we subbed Adam and Eve out for, for John and Shirley, you know where we'd be tonight? Right here. The Bible would just have some different names in it. John and Shirley would have screwed up too. They would have messed up too. We'd have been here tonight, right? So before we say like, oh man, Cain's such a bad guy, I like to read the scriptures and I like to try to find myself. Like I'd love to read all the, the New Testament and be like, oh man, I'm just like Jesus. <laughs> You see me? You see what I did? <laughs> Peace, waves. No. Jesus, we about to die. <laughs> often, often, often I'm the bad guy in these stories. I'm the bad guy. So we've got, let's look at the scene. We've got Cain and Abel. We've got the older brothers. This is the first time we see a sacrifice. I would imagine that maybe they've seen their father perform this, but this is their rite of passage maybe. It's, and I imagine the scene, man, they've got the, the little altar there, and Cain got the veggies. Abel's grilling. And the Lord, we don't really know how, but he accepts one, he rejects the other. Maybe he consumes this one with fire. I, I'm not really sure. But you can imagine being Cain. Man, you're the older brother. He's a little embarrassed, maybe. Maybe he's a little jealous. He's a little hurt. Listen, put two hands up in the air if you love to get corrected by God. That's what I thought. Pastor, zero hands. So imagine being publicly corrected in front of your brother, probably with an angel. I mean, like, this is real. You can imagine, man, like he was in his feelings. So before we just throw Cain out, listen, you're sitting back, you're like, Chris, I wouldn't have killed him. <laughs> but we kill people in our hearts all the time. We write people off as dead to me all the time. Man, I'm through with him. At least Cain kept it 100 when God says, hey, where's your brother? And Cain's like, man, am I, am I responsible for my brother? Am I my, am I my brother's keeper? Some of us would be like, what brother? 
I ain't got no brother. Him? Mm -mm. We kill people in our hearts all the time. All the time. Hear me. Cain's anger was not the sin. It was the scent. It was the invitation. We've got this picture. He says that sin is crouching at the door. And it's like this picture of like a wild animal. And the scriptures say it wants to have you. It wants to consume you. It wants to overwhelm you. Cain's anger was the scent on the wind that brought this sin to the door. So Cain had an opportunity. The Lord gave him an opportunity. He says, Cain, I know you're mad. I know you're hurt. But what will you do with it? That is what will matter. That is what will make the difference. Your unchecked, unprocessed, undealt with emotions bring sin, the opportunity to sin to your front door. You better know that. Listen, it's the same story thousands and thousands of years later. People see red, man, and they flash out and they say some crazy stuff. Listen, let's just, we need to get the microphone and just pass it around. All of the worst things that you've said to another human, all of the worst things that you've done to another human were preceded by some strong emotion. I guarantee it. We could all pass the mic and just tell stories. We all need it like a Snickers because we're not ourselves when the emotions get, when we're hungry, we're not ourselves. I need to tell you about year one of marriage. I learned that about my wife. Don't make her hungry. You would think that, like, I was controlling her stomach. But I'm telling you, I learned. Just pack some snacks in the car. Put them in the side pocket of the door. Hey, you need to eat this. <laughs> no, sometimes, listen, we get to feeling a thing. We get to feeling a thing, and we come to her like, oh, man, I, I shouldn't have said that. You think? You think? <sighs> listen, I want to uh, challenge a thought that, that our emotions are negative and that they're bad. I think that's also kind of crept into the church. Uh, sometimes we think that, that, that our emotions are bad, that if we feel a thing, it's bad. It's not true. Here's, here's how I know. Number one, God has them. So if he's got them, he ain't bad. Number two, he made us. He put them in us, and then he called us good. Number three, just like our bodies, emotions are neutral. You can do bad stuff with your body, you can let your emotions cause you to do bad stuff. But Jesus came to redeem our bodies, right? We can, do, we can build a kingdom with our bodies. It's what he wants us to do. Amen? So your capacity to feel is actually a gift from God. But after the fall, right, sin enters the world and, it, and it's infected our emotions. This is, this is why we can feel emotions today that we were never meant to feel. The, the scriptures say that, that he put them in the garden and says that they were, they were naked and unashamed. And that concept to us makes no sense. We cannot get it. I don't care how much you spend time in the word. You don't know what that's like because we spend a lot of time and energy and money putting all this stuff on. Yet we carry shame like it's an accessory. We carry shame on shame, guilt on guilt. You guys with me? Y'all got real quiet. Yeah, we don't, we don't know what it's like to, to not carry the stuff that we've gotten used to carrying and carrying and carrying. L let's go to another store. We dealt with two, two men. Let's look at the ladies. Ladies, I didn't forget about you. <laughs> I didn't forget, and we don't have to go very far. Let's go to Genesis 16. Let's go to Genesis 16. We've got the story of Abram and Sarai. This is before their names have been changed. Um, uh, Sarai's barren. They don't have any kids. And she gets, a, she gets the bright idea uh, to take Hagar, her Egyptian servant, her slave, and give her to Abram. Yeah. Sounds like a good idea, I guess, in theory. This is a, this is a trap. <laughs> <laughs> Abram, listen, buddy. <laughs> listen to me from the, from the past. Don't do it. <laughs> Let's pick it up in Genesis 16, verse 4. You guys with me? Verse 4, and he went into Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked, listen, with contempt on her mistress. Oh, boy. So, again, these are not felt bored characters. They're real people. 
So you gotta, you gotta get this for a second. Man, I can just see Hagar walking around probably like six weeks along, maybe. Ain't even showing. She walking around holding her tummy, knocking stuff over off the counter, saying stuff on her breath. Look at you with your little flat tummy. Mm. <laughs> probably feigning some, oh, I, I feel something. Hey, Abram, come rub my feet. You know this baby just... She got, to, she got puffed up, guys. She got puffed up, and she was letting Sarah have it. Right? So, Sarah gets done. Verse 5, she says, she says to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. And listen, I, there's an exclamation point in my Bible. I guarantee this, this, this conversation, uh, it was some furniture moving around. It was not quiet. <laughs> Okay, ladies, you know what I'm talking about. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. That sounds like a threat if I have ever heard one. God, if you don't come get him now. But Abram says to Sarai, behold, and I'm going to translate behold. I'm going to bring it a little current. Uh, Abram was like, whoa. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Your servant is in your power. And that's probably something I would have said too. Adam said the same thing. God, this lady that you had gave me, that's you, you made her. I didn't make her. You made her. So Abram, listen, I get it, my man. You are in a tough spot. You are in a tough spot. He says, your servant, your power, you can do to her. I'm out. Abram says, I'm out. So then Sarai de deals harshly with Hagar, and she flees. Now, again, we got to set the scene, guys, because these are real people, real personalities. Hagar is a slave. That's enough right there. That's enough to put you in your feelings right there. She didn't volunteer. She was voluntold. Okay? Number two, Hagar is minding her business, cooking, cleaning, doing whatever you would do in that position. And she comes in one day, and Sarah's like, hey, you see my husband? Yeah, I see him. You're going to be his wife. I, I, he didn't, we ain't been on a date. We didn't, no flowers? What do you mean? Now, Abram is, is 85 years old. I don't want to be with him. I don't want to be with him. You might be 85 in here. You're timeless, okay? You're timeless. I ain't talking about you. But this old guy right here, I don't want him. Abram lived he was 175. He might have been a silver fox. I don't know how it worked back then, but I'm just letting you know. Hagar wasn't petitioning to be with Abram. So she gets pregnant in the table's turn, and she gets puffed up with pride. All, all of the, the, the seeds of anger that she has let build up over time, being a servant, being a slave, man, it starts to rise back up. Now, now the tables have turned. She's got a lot to say. There's a lot of contempt, a lot of stuff that she's been hoarding. And now, hey, I can let it all out. Man, she's pregnant. Mm, Jesus. She's pregnant with a baby, but, man, she was pregnant with, with a little bit more than that. There are some things that, that were conceived many moons ago in her, her past that she was giving birth to, and they were ugly. They were ugly. But the problem is that Sarai was still queen. She's still wife number one. So she has, still has the power and the authority to make her life difficult. So this situation, again, can you guys imagine eating breakfast at this, in this house? Abram's in the middle eating his dry toast because ain't nobody passing the butter at this table. <laughs> Sarah here, Hagar here, dry toast. No conversation. Guys, this is, this, is, this is Jerry Springer if I've ever seen it in real life. This, this was a real household with some real feelings, some real angst. It was not pleasant. And so what do we see? We see Sarah deal harshly with her. And, and do you know how bad things got to be at home for you to take off? You can't call an Uber. There's no cell phones. There's no lifts. You don't have no friends. You know how, how bad things have to be at your house to be six months pregnant and just say, I'm taking off into the wilderness in the Middle East. I'm out of here. Waddles out. And don't come looking. Things were bad. Things were bad. But let's pick it up in verse 7, Genesis 16, 7. The angel of the Lord found her. Thank God. 
Thank you, Lord, you found us. He found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. So, Hagar was asked two questions. Where have you come from? Where are you going? But she's only able to answer one. She could tell you where she came from. She could tell you why she left. Hey, I'm out of there. That blankety blank. You don't know what I've put up with. You don't know what I've dealt with. You don't know what she said to me. But the question that she could not answer was, where is she going? Why is this? Because when you choose to follow your unchecked emotion, you'll find yourself in some lost and lonely places. You're going to find yourself in the wilderness. Anger and contempt and bitterness and hurt and despair and hopelessness. These will all lead you to isolation. And you'll still live in Benton. You'll still live in Bossier. Them folks that you, you, you went to sleep and they were in your house, you'll wake up. They'll still be in your house. But your heart will be isolated. Your soul will be in the wilderness. You know how many people are like living life today in this, these towns of hundreds of thousands of people, sometimes millions, and they're so lonely. They're so lonely. Here's why. Because emotions are great gauges. They are awful guides. They're great gauges. They, they give a lot of information, but they, they make awful guides. I can go outside. My truck's not here, but I can get in my truck, and I can look at my dash, and there's a lot of stuff there. I can tire pressure, and like I can see the temperature, and I know what my MPGs are. But I've got one thing in there that tells me where to go, just one. But when I, when I stop listening to the one thing that I'm supposed to get my direction from, and I start hyper-focusing and responding based on my tire pressure, you know what? I'm going to be in the ditch. <laughs> I'm going to be in the ditch. Yeah. And that's, that's where we've been. We've, we've, we've got our, our, our lives wrecked because we're making decisions based on some unchecked emotion. Listen, if you're walking around your house and you're kicking the dog and you're yelling at the kids and you're grumpy with your wife, man, your emotions are out of whack. Listen, it's telling you something. It's telling you something. Now, what it's not telling you, just because you're, we got a lot of people cashing in marriages because the check engine light is on. That's, no, 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 no. Don't trade in the car. Fix it. I didn't come to preach that one. That's for you too. That's the next, you can. I didn't come here for that. Listen, pay attention to your check engine light. But it doesn't mean get a new vehicle. It doesn't mean to stop walking the road that the Lord has called you to walk. It's telling you to pay attention and give attention to something in your life. Bring the Lord in and let him repair. He's a great mechanic. The, 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 tough, the tough part about Hagar, and I hate that this is in the scriptures. I really, really do. But it's there, so I got to tell you that it's there. <laughs> is is the angel of the Lord says, Hagar, I know, I know, boo-boo, but you know what? You got to go back. It actually uses the word submit. Submission's fun, isn't it? Two hands in the air if it's, if it's, if it's fun. <laughs> Pastor, again, zero hands. I don't know what it is tonight. I don't know if they don't want to participate. I don't. Submission's fun. No, it's not. But what's the lesson in that? The lesson is, even though you feel this, you must do this. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. How was Hagar enabled to go back? Because, man, you got you to gotta think. She waddles back in. And, and, guys, we don't get this in Scripture, but there had to be some conversations. Sarah was probably still tripping. Right? Here's the thing about words, man. You got to be really careful what you say. You can never unhear them. You can never unhear words. They're so powerful. I didn't come to talk about words either, but maybe the Lord wants me to talk about words. As soon as they leave your mouth, guys, they are, they're there. Uh, you don't even have to put it on Twitter. You don't even have to put it on social media. You've written it on someone's heart. It's going to be there. It'll sit there forever. 
So, so Hagar has to come back into this house. And if, if she's anything like me, I'd have probably broke some stuff on the way out. Yeah, I'd have made a mess. I'm going to be honest with you. You're not going to be beating up on me. But she's got to come back in the word says to submit. But how is she enabled to do this? She's got this conversation with the, with the angel of the Lord. And I believe she gained strength because of this. She says, you are the God who sees me. We get the name El, El Roy. And I believe that, that, yes, the Lord found Hagar in the wilderness by the stream. But I think it goes much deeper than that. I think we see that God sees into Hagar. And she says, Hagar, listen, there's literally, quite literally, no one on this entire planet that knows how you feel except me. Nobody on this entire earth at this point. Hagar wasn't famous. There was no scriptures, right? Nobody on the entire earth knows your story, knows your heart, knows the pain, knows what you've endured, knows your sin. Hagar was not perfect in this, guys. No good guys in this, except the angel of the Lord. But he says, I've seen you. And she has, and she was seen, and she knew that she had been seen. And man, it changed her. This is what enabled her to be able to go back, and it gave her strength. And then he pronounces this blessing on her. It's really, really strong. We've got this other misconception in the... Um, maybe in the church, but just in people in general, we, th we think that if we uh, don't pay attention to something, if we look away from it, or if we bury it, that it'll go away. But I, I'm, I'm looking out here, and it's nothing but grown folks in here. That's child behavior. When we think that we can pull the covers up over our head and the boogeyman disappears. Listen, the scriptures say that the kingdom is based on seed, time, and harvest. And you, friends... Are dirt. So if we put something in the ground and bury it and walk away, what do you think is coming up later? I mean, some of us have, have sinned against others or had others sin against us, and we are wounded and we're hurt and we're sad and we're grieved, but we didn't deal with it. We just put it in the ground and we walked away. And now into our adulthood, maybe, all those words that were, 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 were carved onto our heart, Man, it's producing a harvest that we don't like. It's producing a harvest in this. In, 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 in what was planted in your home as a child is being brought up in the home where you're the parent. It's true, right? Listen, the, the scriptures are so clear about like a root of bitterness. There's, there's a thing that wants to go down into you and produce, and it's dangerous. And I'm going to be honest with you, man, I wish it was like easy. And, you know, some roots, I hate plants. We don't do plants well in my house. I'm not even going to talk about her. She, she feels it coming, but I'm not going to talk. <laughs> Listen, my, my, my grandmother's here. She is timeless. You are amazing. Um, she got a green thumb, two of them. Uh, just her whole, whole hands are green, I guess. That's, that's what she, she just be bringing stuff. Um, and she knows about some, some weeding. Listen, those little sprigs, the little, little, tiny little. Boop, boop. That's easy. But that's stuff that happened 20 years ago that's been down there for a minute. And that the, that, that the world and life has miracle growed with the, with the hardness of life. Guys, it just takes work. And it takes his work. Let me move on. Let me move on. Because I told you I wasn't going to keep you here forever. I've got one more story. And it's becoming one of my favorite stories in Scripture. It's in John 11. It is a story of Jesus and Mary, and Martha, and Lazarus. So we know the story. Jesus has delayed. He knows that Lazarus is sick. He delays in coming. He shows up. Martha comes, and she's like, Jesus, have you just been here? And he's like, all right. So she goes and gets Mary, and Mary tries to sneak out back, but the other mourners who in Jewish culture, like, you'd show up, and you, you, we're, gonna be, we're in this together. We're about to cry together. She tries to sneak out, but the other Jews see her, and they, they, they walk with her, and she comes to Jesus. Let's pick it up in verse 32. John eleven thirty two. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Uh, other translation says he was actually angry. He was indignant. He was, he was feeling a thing. 
strong thing. 34, and he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. This is beautiful, beautiful. And if I think about it too much, it makes me weepy. But, the, but this picture here tells us at least two things, probably many things, but it tells us at least two things. Number one is that Jesus is moved by our hurts. Now, he's angry at the, the, the effects of sin. He's indignant. He hates sin and what it does to his people. But what I see here is Jesus is moved by our hurts. Guys, did Jesus know that he was going to... Lazarus was going to be alive in like 12 minutes. He knew it. He knew it. He's about to see Lazarus again. He's not concerned. He knows, correct? Would we, would we agree? So he's not going to be surprised by that event. He's, 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 he's about to see Lazarus. He's hurt because of Mary. Mary's tears. He's hurt, and we don't know their names. Jesus knows every single one of their names. The mourners. He's hurt for their hurt. He's hurt that, 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 that they're having to live through this pain. He hates sin and its effects on our life. The second thing that, that I see is Jesus' humanity is on display. Now, we have no problem thinking that Jesus is fully God. And we say, uh, theoretically, we use our words and we say he's fully man. But we forget that. That's, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around sometimes that he's fully man. But his, his humanity is on display right here. And, and we know that he's actually, he actually feels what we're feeling. See, we, we like to think that Jesus is, is sympathetic. He's not. He's empathetic. Jesus doesn't feel bad that you feel that way. Jesus feels bad because you feel bad. Jesus feels your bad. How do I know this? Isaiah 53, uh, this is the prophecy uh, of Jesus. Verse 3, and he was despised. He knows what that's like. He knows that feeling. And he was rejected. He knows that feeling. He's well aware. He says he's a man of sorrows. I mean, he, he's felt that. He knows that. It says he was acquainted with grief. Guys, he's felt the full gambit of our human emotional experience. And actually, he's felt it to its infinitude because he is, he's, there was no sin in his. His emotions are not broken like ours. They operate to full capacity. So, man, when, when Jesus was low and felt grief, it was, different. It, was, it was to the extreme. There's no limit in him. I don't know if that makes sense, but, but maybe the Holy Spirit will, will clarify that for you. So uh, I'm a practical guy, and I'm, I'm going to land the plane, and I'm going to hand it over. But I want to give you just three really quick things uh, because I, I, I like practicality. How do we deal with this? Chris, you, you laid it out. Our emotions are jacked up. They're infected by sin, but Jesus loves that part of us. And sometimes things can be going amazingly out here. But in here, it's all kinds of jacked up. So what do we do? Three things. Very, very simple. Number one, uh, to be a Christian is to live a life of repentance. Right? We're constantly seeing a thing, realizing our error, and changing. So the very first thing is confess. Now, what did I say at the beginning? Your feeling is not necessarily the sin. Now, if you let it do whatever it wants to do, it'll turn into some sin. <laughs> but we're to confess as a point of weakness because we've got this promise that, man, where I'm weak, his strength is made perfect. Yeah. If you guys ever read the Psalms, you don't even have to go very far in the Psalms. And David just says some wild stuff. Lord, break their, the teeth of the enemy and blast them in the jaw. <laughs> Knock their teeth out. <laughs> That's in the scriptures. The, the, the difference is we just skip the prayer. We just go to knocking people's teeth out. You, you, can't, you, can't, you, you can't skip the prayer, guys. You can't skip the prayer. You've got to confess that feeling. I don't know what it is about it. I've got a, an office at my, my, my house, so when you go into your prayer closet, I don't know why we do this, but I, we step in and we're like, ah, let me just leave that on the outside. Jesus doesn't want to deal with that. Let me just leave that right here. No, no, no. You need to take that stuff in with you. Jesus can handle your, your, your real and authentic and true and honest prayers. G plop down in your chair in the morning and say, Jesus, I'm angry. He can handle it. You think he hadn't been angry? He been angry? 
Jesus, I'm hurt. He didn't know what that's like. I mean, guys, listen, we've, nah, let me not say that. Let me keep it moving. We need to confess our emotions as a point of weakness and exchange our weakness for his strength. Amen? Amen. Number two, number two, uh, the scriptures, the scriptures, it seems very cliche, but listen, guys, if we don't renew our minds, we're going to be out there like David knocking people's teeth out. You'll go to jail. Okay. When you met Jesus, he put another nature inside of you. He put another capacity inside of you. Until we get to glory, though, that capacity works alongside of the regular you, the old you. They work side by side. But the but the whichever one you feed is the one that's going to rule. Listen, we all have the capacity to hate, but the Lord gave us a, 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 a capacity to love. And we have the we have the opportunity to, to despair, but he gave us the capacity to have joy. Yeah. And man, like we are prone to, to be chaotic. Well, sometimes we're our own, we are the storm. I mean, we just a whirlwind. We get up in there, and, but he gave us the, he gave us his peace. Yeah. You go re, read Galatians 5 and it's just this, this list that, that's this, describing this new capacity. But until we renew our minds and remind ourselves, listen, here's, here's the, I should have had an object lesson. This is our spiritual Snickers when you, are about, when you are that close to acting out of character, here it is. This thing is supposed to come up out of you. This thing is producing inside of you. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I really want to knock your teeth out, but I'm going to go pray to Jesus. I really want to give you a piece of my mind, but let me just. We got to have it. We got to have it. Last I believe that when Jesus speaks when, by his Holy Spirit, we're to respond. Amen. There's an action. I'm not about to get up here and say what that action might look like for you. But perhaps, perhaps the Lord is calling you, man, Jesus, I've got this, this thing. I'm, I'm angry. I'm hurt. I'm bitter. I'm wounded. I'm... So, man, what does faith look like in this situation? Maybe the Lord's saying, hey, maybe you need to go bless that person that, that has spitefully used you. Maybe, maybe you need to go... Pray for that person who, who hates you, your enemies. Love your enemies. I wish it wasn't in there, guys, but it's in red. I can't take it out. <laughs> I can't take it out. Listen, maybe, maybe faith looks like, um, God, I'm frustrated. And he says, okay, I, put, I allowed you to be frustrated. I put that frustration in you because I want you to not eject from the situation. I actually want you to change the situation. I want you to add to the situation. I want you to bring some light to the situation. I want you to be an agent of change. We like to just fuss and complaining because that's easy and fun and free. It takes no work. Complaining takes no work. For whatever reason, we can wear ourselves out complaining, but it really didn't take no work at all. Real work is changing something. Maybe, maybe faith looks like you leaning into Christian community. Hagar's out there doing life on, on, on her own. But there's no such thing as a Christian by themselves. He, he, he called us to himself and to one another. There's a body. We don't get to be a Christian alone. So I don't, I don't know what, what the activity looks like for you, but uh, just know that there is. This is my last scripture, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray and hand it over. Uh, Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Jesus um, makes a statement. We know it. Uh, he says, come to me, all who labor. And what he's not saying is everybody who has a nine to five. That's all of us, right? It's not what he's talking about. You break that word open in the Greek, and he's saying those who have grown weary, so those who are tired in your soul, those who have lost heart, those who are emotionally fatigued, If you find yourself in that category, saying, hey, come to me. And if you're heavy laden, again, he's not talking about what we're naturally carrying because I I really believe this, and you know it to be true. The the burdens that we carry here are so much heavier than anything we carry carry naturally. Some of us have been carrying some stuff for, we'd have to measure it in decades. Listen, I'm prone to... Pastor didn't call me because I was perfect. 
He did call me because I was good looking, but I'm not, I'm not a perfect man. Um, without Jesus, I'm prone to beef. Like, I'll just, I'll just put this in the pocket and I'll hold. I don't like the way you looked at me. Shoot, forget, forget. I'll hold on to some stuff for a long time. I will. But Jesus, but Jesus, he says, hey, listen, that, that's, that's too heavy for you to carry. That'll break you. Hurt, holding on to hurt will break you. You're not built to carry it. Your, your frame can't support it. Bitterness, you're not built to carry it. It'll break you. It'll break you. Despair, you're not built to carry it. He's, he wants to walk you through that thing and lighten your load. Verse 29, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Here it is. These are the, the, the three. The confess our emotions as a point of weakness, uh, the scripture and the action. Here it is right here. Take my yoke upon you. That's an exchange. That's that confession. That's, Jesus, I'm giving you my weakness. I'm taking on your strength. And learn from me. There's the scripture. He's the word made flesh. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And then he ends it here in verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, hey, let's walk this thing together. Let's walk this thing out together. It's, it's, it's beautiful because we don't, we, we're, listen, you're going to encounter some things that are tough, hard, challenging, but you've got somebody who's walking alongside of you. Jesus, he's got strong shoulders. He can handle it. Let me pray for us. Holy Spirit, I, I, I pray that the word spoken would go down deep and produce. I thank you for your kindness I thank you for your sensitivity. Jesus, I thank you that you, you know what it's like to be us. That there's not a thing that we could tell you that would run you off. There's not a thing that we could lay upon you that would cripple you. You ask for our cares because you care for us. But I, I'm praying over this, this body tonight that you would grant them strength, boldness and courage to do the casting open our hands God we, we're, we're tired of holding on this stuff that, that is too big for us the same way that you spoke to the sea and you spoke to the wind you spoke to the waves and they responded to you I'm asking by your Holy Spirit that you would speak right now to hearts all across this room Father God where there is anger and there is hurt and there is bitterness and there is grief and there is depression and anxiety and despair and worry and concern speak your peace help us receive your peace I thank you that you're strong enough for us you're strong enough for us and you love us every piece of us the whole of us inside and out May we not withhold a single thing from you. Keep us and bless us as we go in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, guys.